Hello, Dr. Magnus. It's so great to have you here today in our newsroom. So uh, before we get started, just you know, a few words about yourself. So Dr. Magnus, you are currently the economist at the China Center of Oxford University, as well as the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Yeah. But before that, you were the chief economist and then you know, senior economic advisors at UBS Investment Bank from 1995 to 2012, during which period you oversaw multiple episodes of booms and busts in both advanced economies and the emerging markets, including the 2008 financial crisis. And you were also widely acknowledged to have predicted the US subprime mortgage crisis, uh, which would uh, you know, trigger a global recession uh, through a series of research papers you wrote during the period of 2006 to 2007, in which you warned of and imminent Minsky moment. So when you make predictions, we should take you pretty seriously. So here comes my first question. How would you assess China's economic outlook in 2021 and beyond? What are some of the, the, the moving factors that you can identify? I should say, if you want to take my predictions seriously, it often depends on the day of the week, really. So um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, well, obviously the, the economy went through like, everybody else really, a pretty bad uh, patch in 2020 because of the pandemic. But um, as certainly as far as we can see, um, China managed to basically, you know, elbow the pandemic aside to a, to a significant extent by the spring of 2020, after which the economy has bounced back. So it looks like, um, I mean, a lot of private sector economists and the IMF and um, many other people are expecting very high rates of growth in China this year, maybe uh, eight or 9%. My own view is it won't be as high as that because I think the government will want to uh, undo some of the stimulus that it injected into the economy in 2020. A lot of the things that the government wants to emphasize like service producing industries, consumption, didn't do very well last year. A lot of the things that the government would rather downplay, like infrastructure spending and credit creation, actually did flourish in 2020. So we, we want to see a little bit, I think the government wants to see a little bit of a reversal of that in 2021. Uh, but I think, the, I think the economy will grow by a very, very healthy amount, say around, you know, 7% or so. Um, but uh, I think it'll be quite important for economists to be looking at the, the momentum of the economy during the year. So we'll see very high rates of growth year over year in the first half of 2021. And then as we get into the second half of the year, my expectation is that growth will slow down again. And then by 2022, I think the economy is going to be back kind of where it was in 2019, which is facing a number of structural headwinds, which obviously the 14th five-year plan, uh, which will have been approved by the National People's Congress, uh, is designed to kind of address. I see. So, you know, since you talk about the, the 14th uh, five-year plan, so let's just get, get on to that part. As we know, last Friday, uh, the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang read out to the NPC delegates a government's work report, which basically, you know, reviews the government's accomplishments over the past year and also gives guidance on the government's economic policy direction in the upcoming year. So what are some of the key takeaways from that report you would like to highlight to our audience? Yeah, there's quite a lot of stuff that the Premier talked about. And um, so there are a number of takeaways, but I'll, I'll try and condense them into kind of short kind of synopsis. Obviously, looking backwards, um, I mean, the government obviously is very, um, you know, relieved and certainly pleased that it was able to um, manage the pandemic in the way that it did. Um, and of course, there was great celebration, uh, notably of um, uh, General Secretary uh, Xi Jinping about um, the uh, eradication of poverty. I mean, we can have a little discussion about what that actually means, because um, maybe extreme poverty is the way that we should describe it, actually. Um, so that that's all to the good. Um, but there are a number of things uh, that I think are kind of takeaways when we're looking forward, um, not just to 2021, but also to the period 2021-25, which is the period of the plan, and of course, the 10 years that follow that as well. Uh, so not setting a growth target for the plan 
was certainly something which a lot of economists noticed, right? So China's been uh, kind of encouraged by people for a long time to drop its growth target, which it, on the one hand, it seems to have done that for the five-year plan. On the other hand, the Premier said that um, China would have a growth target in 2021 of more than 6%. That'll be very easy. That's like what, falling off a log in a fast flowing river. Um, but I think he also said that there would be um, you know, annual targets where appropriate. So it's not quite the strictly speaking the case that growth targets have been dropped, but they certainly look like they've been downgraded a bit. Um, most other economic variables have kind of guidelines which are non-binding. There were binding guidelines for environmental and ecological um, objectives, as well as research and development and military spending. So this again speaks to a kind of a shift in emphasis. Obviously, the big lead that science, technology and innovation are supposed to play um, during the next several years was a very big um, uh, part of the uh, work report and, and the plan uh, looking forward. Um, there was uh, obviously a references to, you know, why or what China has to do to become a manu manufacturing powerhouse um, over the next five to ten years. Interestingly, former industry minister um, spoke last weekend and said that there were, um, that China was 30 years away from becoming an industry powerhouse. So, um, there is obviously a, a kind of a tension there between what China aspires to do and, and its current status. Um, I thought there were kind of interesting ob uh, kind of um, comments really made or references in the plan to addressing uh, aging. So there were vague references to uh, raising the retirement age for men and women, although no specific details. Um, there was also references to um, amendments to the household registration system, the hukou system, uh, which uh, we've seen these things before. They're really, really important um, to, to make changes to this system um, because they keep uh, the rural part of China's economy in a very kind of uh, dire state relative to the urban areas. Um, but we'll see whether things like this um, can be made to happen because there's a lot of resistance uh, and it's very expensive. Um, and national security is something which everybody everywhere in the world is talking about now. And the linkage between economic security and national security obviously is becoming very important. I see. You know, you mentioned this idea of sort of the fusion of national security and economics. You know, in a recent commentary you wrote on War on the Rocks, which I thought was really interesting. So can you take this opportunity to elaborate some of your key points? Uh, specifically, you know, how and why have China's economic prowess become so intertwined with its political, uh, geopolitical ambitions? And how shall the world respond to it smartly? Yeah, um, good questions. I mean, you know, if we think back to a lot of people have kind of spoken about the relationship between China and the United States, China and the Western world now is Cold War 2.0, which, you know, it may be, you know, appropriate, inappropriate language uh, for a different discussion. But it's certainly very unlike uh, Cold War 1.0 with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a big uh, military and nuclear power, which had very little economic relevance to the United States. China obviously is an aspiring and a very big regional and military and nuclear power, but it has huge economic relevance because the economic integration uh, between China and the rest of the world is uh, unparalleled, I would say. Um, and um, the speed, obviously, with which this has happened during the last 20, 25 years is also uh, unprecedented. So it's very... Uh, you know, it seems to me self-evident, really, that uh, some of the things that we have arguments about. So in the past, say, you know, the United States had arguments about trade with Western Europe in the 1970s. It had huge arguments with the Japanese about trade and commerce and investment in the 1980s. Um, but those were different from what's going on now with China, right? Because with China, um, it it's not only much bigger and much more um, uh, dominant in a lot of manufacturing and supply chains than was the case with Europe and Japan many decades ago. Um, but also um, it's kind of, it's spilled over into a sort of a values-based 
kind of um, argument, shall we say, because when we're talking about um, not just, you know, it's not just really about grains or about, um, you know, regular imports of steel or, you know, anything. When we're talking about technology and data systems and, you know, semiconductors and all the things that we all hope to derive prosperity and, you know, productivity from in the future, um, everybody wants to be top dog. Everybody wants to have proprietary use of their technologies that they can commercialize and brand and milk, uh, you know, for their advantage. So it's inevitable that um, uh, China and the Western world are going to kind of clash over commercial issues, but it's the values based differences between the two which are making this so um, fractious and so sensitive. So when we talk about national security, obviously, um, that involves kind of supply chain. So, for example, you know, China, you know, would very much like to develop semiconductor industries and fabrications independently of American companies on which it still depends. You know, the Americans want to develop technology and the Internet and, um, uh, you know, data uh, privacy in ways which uh, it, it, what it does not want, you know, Chinese what they call interference in that sector. So, you know, there are lots of things that we obviously are finding it very difficult to engage about nowadays. Um, there are lots of things that we should still engage about where our interests are aligned, but um, but the, the the intersect between economic and national security is um, is quite it's not unique, but it's quite special, I would say, in modern times. I see. So you know, speaking of um, national security, I think there's another aspect, which is this idea of financial interdependence and how that might reinforce or threaten, you know, one's national security. So you know, during the trade war with the United States, we heard chatters of the potential of the trade war becoming a full-fledged financial war. The idea is that you know the U.S. dollar-based global finance financial system still has a lot of hold over China's system, and you know China has the security holdings uh, denominated in US dollars. So that could potentially lead to some, you know, implications on how the two financial systems could intersect or sever. Do you think, you know, in the foreseeable future, we'll see some movement in the financial sector? And what will that look like? Uh, well, a couple of points here. I mean, first of all, I think the, the risk of this sort of trade war spilling over into a full-fledged financial war, uh, I think was greater under the Trump administration than it is than it seems to me to be now under the Biden administration. We don't really, it's very early days because obviously the Biden administration hasn't really kind of laid out, should we say, it's kind of China policy. And there are still, um, you know, a lot of speculation that in the not too distant future, there may be um, sounding out meetings between senior politicians between Washington and Beijing as a prelude maybe to a meeting between um, President Biden and President Xi Jinping. So, um, you know, I, I don't expect that we're going to go headlong into a kind of financial war. Having said that, obviously the dollar being the world's reserve currency confers upon the United States some quite considerable advantages of, and leverage. Um, so the dominance of the US in the payment system, uh, the fact that the vast majority of trade transactions and settlements in foreign exchange are made in US dollars through the SWIFT system, so-called SWIFT system, which is a Belgium-based um, kind of clearinghouse mechanism, uh, which has, you know, thousands of banks reporting transactions to clear. Um, so I think, in, you know, privately, if not in public, I'm sure that China's leadership would like to, would like the, the world's finance system to move away from the US dollar. And in fact, the Chinese government itself is taking measures to try to facilitate that through setting up a rival system to SWIFT, which will clear transactions denominated in yuan. Um, and in fact, the, the, the so-called digital yuan or the e-yuan as it's known, in which the People's Bank of China has probably stolen a march really over most other central banks for the time being, um, is going to be, it's pilot rolled out here. They plan to do more of it, I think, before the uh, Winter Olympics in 2022. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, this is a 
this is a payment system, really. Uh, it's a very clever payment system. It's a very um, smart surveillance based payment system. But some people think wrongly, in my view, some people think that it does pose a threat to the dominance of the US dollar. Um, and maybe for that reason, you know, uh, China's leaders will be uh, keen to kind of follow it up. I think it's going to lead down a, a blind alley, but um, it, it's a possibility, I guess. I see, I see. You know, as we, as you mentioned, sort of the difference between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, I think there's another person to keep in mind, which is Xi Jinping, the leader of China. You know, there was a change in Washington leadership, but Xi Jinping managed to stay on power. And, you know, if, if all predictions are correct, he's going to stay in power for another five years or even a decade. So what do we know about Xi Jinping as a leader, especially his vision on China's economic growth? Well, I think, um, uh, what do we know? I mean, I think we know, I mean, there are probably people who know quite a lot um, and even they would probably acknowledge that they don't know that much um, because actually trying to decipher um, the status of the president, you know, within China and within the party, very, very hard for us to read from the outside. Um, but uh, by all accounts, and so far as we can tell, um, he enjoys um, a very, very kind of strong, stable position at the moment. Um, obviously, things that could have gone wrong. I mean, some people may remember that a year ago, um, people were talking about China having a Chernobyl moment, um, uh, likening the pandemic to the situation that um, the Soviet Union found itself in when the nuclear reactor blew up. Um, that clearly had a shelf life of about a couple of weeks um, because, you know, China has come through that okay. And um, I mean, the, the one thing that I would say is that there probably is not a unanimity of view in um, amongst China's upper echelons of the party about um, how to deal with the United States and how what position China should have with regards to its diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Um, so I think we'll all be watching this pretty carefully. I mean, the president's, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the power of President Xi Jinping, I mean, derives not so much from his presidency as much as his party position and his chairmanship of the Central Military Commission. And, and so everybody kind of understands that he's, he's basically a very powerful individual within the party. Um, there don't seem to be any obvious threats to him that we can see. If he does have enemies, they're keeping themselves very quiet and very low. Um, and uh, for the time being, that's just the way things will be. Um, what will happen in the 2020s may depend very much on Sino-US relations, may depend on what happens in the South China Sea, what happens in China's economy and so on. Too many things that are really quite unpredictable and quite volatile. Um, but for the moment, um, yeah, he looks looks pretty secure. Yeah, and you know, he himself also projects that kind of confidence. I think in multiple post-COVID uh, occasions, Xi Jinping really struck a confident tone, saying to senior leadership that, you know, the country now has, is entering a time of opportunity when the East is rising and the West is declining, right? But if I remember correctly, uh, in a book you wrote a few years ago, Red Flags, you put together a list of downside risks for China's growth potential, um, which you think the CCP leadership is not equipped to address. So has the government's pandemic response or China's performance during the past year changed any of your assessment? And what could go wrong with Xi Jinping's ambition and confidence to overtake the West? Yeah, so I think, um, so my, my views haven't changed. I mean, my, the, the book came out in 2018, which is not that long ago. And then um, in 2019, they brought out um, a revised version with additional material. Um, and then obviously the pandemic hit. So um, I d I, nothing's really changed for me, to be honest. And in fact, if anything, I would say that the pandemic has thrown up uh, what I call the pandemic paradox. Um, so the paradox is that, that, that the pandemic has taught or has convinced, I think, China's leadership that strong leadership, authoritarianism, social control, that these things really do work. Um, in a public health emergency. And if you obviously compare China's um, ability to manage the COVID pandemic compared with the problems that many Western countries 
not just Western, but other countries have had, then you know you could understand why um, uh, the leadership in Beijing will basically say, well, you know, we managed to figure that out and you didn't. Um, having said that, the paradox is that this kind of governance style is not ideally um, situated or positioned really to deal with the problems and issues that countries face in economic development. So people often make the comparison and they say, well, look where South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore were in the 1980s. That's where China is now. And this is the model to follow, you know, over the next 20 or 30 years. My view is a little bit different from that. I think that I would say, look where Mexico and Brazil were in the 1980s. And this is kind of where China is kind of now. But look where Mexico and Brazil are today, which is actually not that much further advanced than they were um, 40 years ago. It probably will be a little bit different in China because the government system is quite different and the um, pragmatism of the leadership in terms of um, economic policy and, and economic management is a little bit different. But uh, the challenges really are about overcoming what I call structural headwinds. One of them is the debt burden, which will be a depressant on growth. Another will be rapid aging. Uh, so China is not the oldest country on earth, but it's the most rapidly aging country on earth. Um, and it's, it's getting old very, very quickly, much more quickly than, than the Western world did at much lower levels of income per head. So that's a depressant on growth. Um, productivity has stalled in China too, uh, as it has done elsewhere in the world. But the, the struggle to get productivity moving again, which is what future living standards and prosperity and jobs depend on, really is about uh, how robust and how efficient your institutions are, like legal institutions, competition institutions, regulatory institutions, education institutions. Um, if you can fix those institutions, you can basically solve your problems. And my kind of uh, issue with this is that I think in China, there is a tension between fixing the institutions and the political rigidity of the party. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, during the Trump administration, we frequently uh, heard from you know, U.S. official talking about we are trying to force a market oriented reform to China through our trade war. Do you think it's possible to actually force China's hands through something like a trade war to basically force China onto the track of a more market oriented economy and those institutions that you mentioned? No. Uh, and in fact, I think, uh, I mean, say what you do, what we want to say about um, former President Trump. I mean, the one thing that I suppose he will uh, be able to sort of um, keep as part of his legacy is that on his watch, we did rethink the relationship uh, with China and other countries, um, which was probably overdue. Um, but I think the idea that you can use trade sanctions and commercial sanctions to force, uh, you know, change in another country. I think, I mean, to me, that was always a flawed idea. And the, um, the idea that, you know, that the American government could change bilateral trade balances, I mean, just didn't make any economic sense at all. So, yeah, no, I don't think that was ever going to work. I mean, if there's going to be change in China, it's going to come from within rather than from without. Um, having said that, um, I know I'm under, you know, I don't doubt at all that for the foreseeable future, that the economic and the commercial environment in which China finds itself vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world is going to be much harsher than anything it's experienced since the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, and this, you know, it is quite important. It's basically also what the 14th five-year plan is trying to address President Xi Jinping actually already announced last autumn uh, the so-called dual circulation strategy, which is a way of decoupling, if you want to put it that way, and increasing self-reliance for Chinese industry and Chinese engineering and science. But um, yeah, I think the best, well, the most we can do really is just to um, 
Just keep talking about stuff. Yeah, so that's basically, you know, what the, the picture we have in line for China's, uh, you know, economic growth in the future. This has been such insightful conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Magnus, for talking to me today. Thank you so much. Thank you.